You weren't so damn clumsy. Abigail, do you trust me? There's a single dose of laudanum by the bed. Take it. It will help with the pain. Is there a doctor in this town? Oh, actually, I am a doctor, but... Even five minutes of your time. Please. Uh, ma'am, you can't go in there. This is a crime scene. Abigail! I, I, I warned you, ma'am. You need to answer some questions. I left her with a single vial of laudanum. When I went to get the tickets, uh, that's not enough to cause harm. And you're certain it was the correct dosage? Yes, of course. How can you be sure? Uh, well, I... In absence I... of any other explanation, is it not most likely that Abigail Prescott died because you provided her with the wrong bottle of laudanum? Yes, it's, it's possible. Seven, nine, no, eight. There's a page missing. This is my interview with the hotel clerk. The last time she saw Mrs. Prescott is when she made a telephone call in the middle of the night. She made a telephone call? Is that important? Yes. The jury has found you guilty of manslaughter in the death of Abigail Prescott. What? <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Murdoch. Good morning, Bethany. Oh, she has been quite the handful this oh. morning. <laughs> well, usually when the little one is fussy like this, Dr. Ogden would sing her a lullaby. Sleep, my baby, on my bosom. Warm and cozy will it prove. Round the mother's arms are folding in her heart a mother's love. Sleep. We need something substantial to justify filing this appeal. Yes, but what about that call? If the alderman knew where we were, he, he could have killed her. The hotel owner didn't hear the telephone conversation that Abigail was having, and the switchboard operator doesn't remember who she put the call through to. It's a dead end. There's no way to prove who she called. Uh, why did she make that call? Do you think... She could have been having second thoughts about leaving her husband. I should never have encouraged her. There's no way to know what was in her mind, but you know what was in your heart. You were simply trying to help a woman in need, Julia. Yes, and now that woman is dead. Surely the fact that someone removed a page from the police report should warrant an appeal, shouldn't it? The judge clearly didn't think so. Then we'll speak to a different judge, a higher court. I'm sorry, but it's not enough. A page could go missing for any number of reasons. Any judge will consider it no more than an error. How are you fearing, sir? I feel hopeless, George. I wish there was something I could do. What did Effie have to say? She said we could appeal, but our chances are slim at best. We've lost in the eyes of the court. I can't believe it. Our Dr. Ogden in such a dire circumstance. They've sentenced her to three years. For something she didn't do. And, and we'll do everything we can to prove that, sir, to prove it to the court. Of course, George, but it may not be enough. Julia is going to miss raising her daughter. So don't say that. <laughs> her first words, her first steps, three years. She'll be a completely different person by the time her mother gets out of prison. Will she even recognize her? You can't. You can't let these thoughts consume you. I know, George, but it's true. Julia is in prison, sleeping in a cot in a windowless room. I I'm spending every day and night trying to raise our daughter without her. I, I just don't think I can do it alone. Sir, you don't have to. No matter what happens, one thing I can promise you, you won't be alone. Thank you, George. Is that the alderman's fundraiser? I believe so. He has some nerve. Thank George. Thank you, thank you, thank George. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Helping people has always been my mission, especially when it comes to the people of Toronto. We need state-of-the-art facilities where the average...
average man can get top-of-the-line health care. That is why I want to raise money to open a new hospital for the less fortunate. Oh, that's rich. Now, this here is my friend David. He was born with a bad leg and is one of the many people who will be helped by our new endeavor. Now, he's going to be coming around with a collection tin. If you see him, give him a few dollars. Let's get to our donation goals. Every penny... Is that all? Good day, detective. I know what you did, Prescott. And I won't rest until I prove it. Whatever could you mean? Have you spoke to Julia? How's the spirits? Not good, I'm afraid. Oh, this is a nightmare. What's your next move, Murdoch? I'm sure it was Alderman Prescott. I just can't prove it. He was the recipient of the telephone call that's mentioned in the page of the report that's now conveniently missing. But perhaps the question shouldn't be, why is it missing? But how? Inspector at Port Credit? It was his report. You know you have my full support and the full resources of this station house if you need anything. Thank you, sir. There is another avenue to follow. If we're correct, the alderman had to have traveled from his home in Toronto to Port Credit between the time of the telephone call and when Abigail's body was discovered. Someone may have seen him leave his house that day. Perhaps he hired a carriage. Surely an alderman would own his own carriage. In which case, you'll have a driver. George, Henry, see what you can find out. Yes, sir. I did nothing wrong. And I resent the accusation. A file was sent to the Crown and to the defense. Both were missing the same page of your report. So the incident had to have occurred before the documents left this station house. You're suggesting one of my men lost the page? Or mishandled it? Intentionally. No. My men are honest and trustworthy. Is that so? so I, I work with them every day. I trust them with my life. But do you not trust your constables with yours? You hand wrote the page, correct? That's right. Then who copied it? What do you mean? Every page of those documents was collated into two separate files. One went to the Crown, one went to the defense. Someone had to have copied the original in order to... Oh, yes, that would be Mr. Johnson, our scrivener, that's him there. If you'll excuse me. Mr. Johnson, Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. I have a couple of questions. Uh, right now, I'm uh, kind of busy. Are you the Scrivener that handled the case report for the trial of Dr. Julia Ogden? I am. Are you aware that a page went missing from that report prior to trial? No, I, I don't know anything about that. Can you confidently say that all of the pages were accounted for when you received the report from Inspector McRae? How could I possibly know? <laughs> he attests that as a fact. And yet a page was missing from the files that went to the Crown and the defense. Things get lost all the time. By you? No, never. I, 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 uh... And yet it went missing when it crossed your desk. Perhaps I should have another word with Inspector McRae and advise him not Please. to hire... Don't tell the Inspector. Tell me exactly what happened. Two days before the trial, I ran into a man in the street near my rooms. He knew about the trial, and he even knew that the file was currently in my hands. Who was this man? I'd never seen him before in my life. He offered me a hundred dollars to remove two pages. H how can I pass that up? Two pages, not just one? Uh, one page from the police report, one from the coroner's report. But there was nothing on them, nothing that seemed important. 
That is not for you to determine, Mr. Johnson. But I, I needed the money. Do you have any idea how much $100 is? My, my wife, I, 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 I needed the money, sir. Please, pull yourself together, man. Look at this photograph. Is this the man that gave you the money? No, I, I don't recognize him. Then who was it? I told you, I'd never seen him before. Uh, the man had a goatee, a, a rough face, and he talked awful funny. All right. I'll need you to give a description to a sketch artist. Of course. That must be his driver. We'll see if he knows anything. Yeah, we need to get him on his own so we can talk to him. Right. We have to do whatever we can to get Dr. Rogden back home. She doesn't belong in jail. She has killed someone before. Henry, she's innocent. Oh, look, this is our chance. Excuse me, sir. Yes. How can I help you? Uh, condolences for the passing of Mrs. Prescott. A nasty business, that. We're conducting an additional investigation into her death. Is that right? Uh, should I get the alderman? Uh, no, actually, we wanted to speak to you. Can you tell us anything about the day that Mrs. Prescott died? Did you take the alderman anywhere that day? No. Uh, I was given the afternoon off that day. And are you usually given the afternoon off? No. Uh, that morning, we went about our business as usual. I took him to his tailor's, then back to the house, just like every day. Uh, usually, I wait around after that, but that day, the alderman went inside the house and came back out a short time later telling me to take the rest of the day off. Hey, he goes to the tailors every day? Well, it's his business. He owns it. Uh, Impressively Press Tailors over on Sherborne. Oh, I've been there before. Uh, they are very good. Uh, well, it does fine business. Uh, we pick up the earnings there every day and take them to the bank. Every day? Mr. Wright, you are the coroner who performed the postmortem on Abigail Prescott. Uh, th that's right. And you delivered your report to this station house, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Did you happen to keep a copy of your report for your record? Uh, no, I assumed I would receive it back after the trial. Could you have a look at the report and tell me if there's anything missing? Yeah, yes, there is a page missing. Any idea what that page contained? Of course, it was the page that detailed the bruising across the victim's body. Bruising? What bruising? Extensive. Arms, back, torso. Any sense of what may have caused them? Likely from repeated blows, but none of this had anything to do with her death. These were minor contusions, painful, but not serious. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, if I may, did you happen to notice if any of the bruises were more recent than others? Yes, yes, there was one on her arm. Her broken arm? No, her other arm. Uh, it was about a few inches wide, quite fresh. So someone grabbed her. They stole the pages to hide the fact that they'd injured her in an altercation? Or it's an indication of something else altogether. What are you thinking? It's your professional opinion that Abigail Prescott consumed 100 drams of laudanum. Correct. Dr. Ogden maintains that she instructed Abigail Prescott to consume one vial containing only 16 drams of laudanum. What if the extra laudanum wasn't consumed? What if it was injected? A rough injection leaving a bruise? It's possible. Did you happen to find any injection marks? No, but I can't say I was looking for one. Well, if the overdose of laudanum was injected, then it wasn't Mrs. Ogden who killed Mrs. Prescott. A revelation like this would immediately discount the Crown's case. It's too late now. She's in the ground. We'll have to get her out. So the alderman was left to his own devices the rest of the day. You know, he could have driven himself down to Port Crater if that was the case. Should we report back to the inspector then? It's not worth much if nobody saw him there. I still think it's strange that they make a visit to the tailors every day. Oh, it's this place right here. I tell you, it's the worst tailors I've ever been to. I had to go back three times, and I still don't have my pants. I'd abandon them if they weren't Ruthie's favorite pair. It's hardly bustling. How much revenue can they be making? 
Just enough to keep the doors open, I would guess. Yet they make so much that they have to make a deposit at the bank every day? I'm surprised they make enough to make a deposit every year. Higgins, that chap, that's... That's the downtrodden man I saw at the fundraiser earlier. He doesn't look downtrodden at all. Oh, scoundrel, he must be a confidence man. The Scrivener who transcribes the documents for trial was paid to remove two pages. Paid by whom? Apparently not the alderman. We questioned the Scrivener, and he gave us a description of the culprit. Now, Inspector McCrae is putting these up all over town. This is the man. I know that man. What? <sighs> My dear Bianca is terribly ill. Five minutes of your time. Please. I was on the way to buy the tickets from the train station, and he asked if I wanted a ride. Then he said he needed a doctor. Someone was ill? No, not someone. It was his goat, but there's nothing I could do. By the time I got back to the hotel, Abigail was dead. Julia, did this man speak in an unusual manner? Yes, he had an accent. Well, then this is him. He purposely delayed your return back to the hotel so that someone would have time to murder Abigail Prescott and frame you. This is the man that bribed the Scrivener and delayed Julia on her way back to the hotel. Unlikely to be a coincidence. I have constables canvassing the area and putting up these posters. Hopefully someone will have seen something. I need to speak to Detective Murdoch. Who's this then? Oh, that is Mrs. Lip now. She owns the hotel in Port Credit. Ma'am, may I be of assistance? You need to pay for this phone call. This is your telephone bill. Why should I... Your wife booked a room at my hotel and incurred this exorbitant charge. But now she is in jail. It is only fair that the responsibility of the debt fall to her husband. She has a point, madam. This must be Abigail Prescott's telephone call. Yes, God rest her soul. But where could she have been calling to incur a charge of one dollar and nineteen cents? A dollar nineteen? I almost keeled over when I saw it. I never should have had that infernal thing installed in the first place. I will take care of this, Mrs. Lipnow. Leave it with me. Why, thank you, Detective. That's his office? Could be. An accountant masquerading as a person in need to draw up donations for the alderman's fundraiser. Can't believe you let that man trick you into giving him money. See, he was convincing, and we very convincing. I never should have told you that. I still don't see how the tailor shop is connected. Unless it's not a tailor shop at all. Oh, I assure you, there was a tailor in there. An old man with a dreadful shake in his hands. That's not what I mean, Henry. What would an accountant? be doing with a failing business right after drumming up money for charity. I'm on the edge of my seat. Pretending that same business earned that same money so no one would notice you and the aldermen were stealing from the people of Toronto. So the tailor shop is just a front then. Oh, look, there he is again. Let's have a word. What have you got? Well, sir, I think I may be able to determine the area that Abigail called with the information in this telephone bill. How do you figure that? All I have to do is cross-reference the cost of the call with the applicable long-distance rates. Won't that take forever? Well, no, sir. A dollar and 19 cents is only divisible by two numbers, 7 and 17. And 1 and 119. Well, yes, but we could probably discount those because there are no regions that cost a dollar 19 per minute, and we know she wasn't on the telephone for 119 minutes. Go on. So she either made a seven-minute phone call at a rate of 17 cents per minute or a 17-minute call at a rate... Seven cents a minute. Precisely, which drastically reduces the possibilities. Right, um, here. 17 cents per minute, Paris, Ontario. The alderman doesn't live there. No, but Abigail's mother does. Excuse me, sir. You know the alderman, do you not? 
Doesn't everybody? We saw you at his tailor shop earlier. Why on earth were you spying on me at a tailor shop? Well, what were you doing there? Yeah, more to the point, were you pretending to be a homeless man earlier at the alderman's fundraiser? How ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, sir. You were drumming up donations, which I think you're now scheming to hide his profits from his tailor shop. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you owe my friend here 25 cents, and you owe me a pair of pants. What? So why don't you just tell us, Mr. Potter, if that is indeed your name? How is the alderman involved in all this? I don't know why you and your lot continue to pour salt in my wound. Is it not bad enough that your wife caused my daughter's death? This is Delafonte. I am terribly sorry to ask any more of you, but I assure you it is important. I'll keep it short. Did your daughter Abigail telephone you the night before her death? Yes. She did. Oh. What did she say? Abigail telephoned me to tell me that she had absconded with that woman, your wife. Why did she feel the need to tell you this? She was scared, I suppose. Of? of what might become of her, of course. A woman can't simply leave her husband. There are consequences for such things, which is precisely what I told her. You told her to go back? Of course. Her husband had broken her arm. Oh, no marriage is a simple affair, detective. And did she agree to return to Toronto? No. She was resolved. Come what may. Those were the last words she said to me. <laughs> so you don't believe that she telephoned Mr. Prescott after her conversation with you? I do not. That is why I telephoned him. You? You telephoned Mr. Prescott that night? I did. And you told him where she was? Yes. It's only right for a husband to know of his wife's whereabouts. <sighs> Mrs. Delafonte, I'm very sorry to put you through anything further, but I will need you to attest to this call. Why? I need to present this as evidence to the judge. <sighs> Alderman Prescott has claimed repeatedly that he did not know his wife's whereabouts that night. He lied. Lied to the judge, to the jury, to the investigators. I investigators who believe that someone has destroyed evidence in this case. No, he couldn't have. done <laughs> so the alderman knew where she was meaning that he likely went down there to kill her at the very least i can now prove to the judge that he lied under oath what now well i've telephoned effie crabtree we'll get the mother's statement and prepare our case for an appeal inspector brackenry middle for you. Detective Murdoch. Something bad is about to happen to your wife. What? Next time it's going to be worse. Drop the case. Who is this? Hello? Hey, new girl. Excuse me? Did you steal my cigarettes? No, I don't smoke. I said, give me back my cigarettes. <laughs> it was her. She attacked me. She's lying. She tried to kill me. Well, it doesn't matter. You're both going to the hall. Go ahead. What do you mean I can't speak with her? Where is she? 
<clears throat> what did they say? Only that she isn't in her cell. I, I have to get down there. Go, go. My lord, there has clearly been outside interference in this case. Just yesterday, I learned that the police scrivener removed two pages of the case file after being bribed. Pages that would make no difference to the outcome of this case. What my learned friend is failing to mention is that there was something about these pages which somebody didn't want the court to know. What were on those pages? The first page detailed a phone call which the deceased made the night before her death to her mother, who in turn telephoned her husband, Alderman Prescott, to retrieve her. Relevance, my lord. A third party at the murder scene completely changes this case and casts a shadow on the theory which my learned friend here laid out at trial. But more importantly, Mr. Prescott lied. He claimed to have no knowledge of his wife's whereabouts at the time of her murder, when in fact, he knew precisely where she was. And the second page? The second page detailed bruising all over the deceased's body. My lord, it seems my friend here has forgotten that the victim died from an overdose of laudanum, not bangs and bruises. Bruises which may well have been covering an injection mark from a syringe which could have been administered by a third party, namely Alderman Prescott. My lord, these are slanderous allegations. Are we now prematurely convicting an innocent man without the benefit of trial? I was under the impression that one had to be convicted by a court of law before being deemed guilty. I am simply articulating a version of events which fits more cleanly with the facts as we now know them. Regardless, these facts cast grave doubt on the conviction of Dr. Ogden in this case. I acknowledge there are discrepancies of some interest, but they do not appear to be significant enough to vacate a conviction, Mrs. Crabtree. Not yet, but they do demand that we re-examine the crucial evidence in this case, the method of death. She died of laudanum. That is not a question. Not the cause, the method which is why I humbly request that the court order the exhumation of the body of Abigail Prescott. To what end? If one of the bruises on her body was covering up an injection mark which was otherwise unaccounted for, then we can assume that the fatal dose was administered by syringe, in which My case Lord. the Crown's allegations against Dr. Ogden no longer hold. My Lord, disturbing a corpse is not a simple thing. It is improper and disrespectful to defile a resting place on a fanciful whim. An exhumation would require permission from the family of the deceased. My lord, Alderman Prescott will not provide such permission. If we asked, and he denies, can we put this whole matter to rest? It has been proven Mr. Prescott lied in this court. We cannot let this decision lie in his hands. As it so happens, the Alderman is not the deceased's only family. Mrs. Crabtree, if you can obtain permission from Mrs. Prescott's mother, I will approve the exhumation. I want to see Julia Ogden immediately. Detective Murdoch. Thank you. Your wife is fine. Where is she? She was in an altercation with another inmate and received a laceration on her forearm. What? But she is otherwise in fine health. Take me to her immediately. I cannot. She's had to spend a night in the hole, just like any other inmate would. You take these sorts of altercations very seriously. Has her wound been treated? Yes. The wound was cleaned and bandaged. Our nurses are well trained. Mr. Warden, I, I received a telephone call threatening Julia's life. We need to put a guard on her at all times, more than one if possible. I have no way of knowing who is making these threats. Detective... You sound paranoid. I received this telephone call at the station house. Uh, I'll see to it that she receives additional supervision for the time being. Thank you. Smoker's cough. No wonder you wanted your cigarettes back so badly. Keep provoking me. See what happens, sweetie. You know, I don't believe your cigarettes were ever missing. It was just an excuse to attack me. Oops. Did someone put you up to it? I wouldn't have pegged you for the type of lady with a long list of enemies. But here we are. Who was it? Wouldn't you like to know? I don't blame you. 
I don't care one way or the other. I know what it's like to be a woman in a vulnerable position, being manipulated by people with bad intentions. That sounds like a long and fancy way to say you pity me, huh? I hate pity. That's not it. Whoever hired you is just using you to do their dirty work while you take the fall. You could have been hurt. <laughs> or you could have killed me and ended up with a lifetime sentence. People like that don't deserve to be protected. Fifty dollars. I beg your pardon? That's my price. Fifty dollars and I'll give you the name. Ah, oh, Murdoch. Mrs. Prescott's exhumation has been approved. The mother agreed to it. It will commence first thing tomorrow morning. That is good news. Who will perform the examination? The original coroner, but overseen by Miss Hart. The judge has agreed to send the body to our morgue. Oh? Why is that? Apparently, every man and his dog wants to attend. We're the only ones with the space for it. I see. I would also like to attend. Good luck getting the judge to approve that. Look, don't worry. I'll make sure everything goes off all right. If we can find that syringe, Mark, this will all be over. And if we don't find it? We have to exonerate Julia now. She was attacked in prison. Her life's in danger. So they're stealing from charitable citizens? That's what we suspect, sir. That behavior's lower than a snake's belly. But this chap even pretended to have a bum leg to garner donations out of sympathy. An absolute disgrace. Where is he now? Uh, he got away, sir. He was actually surprisingly fast on his feet. But this tailor shop is the center of it. That's where they're taking all the money. It seems so. Take a few of the lads and ransack the place. Gladly. Well, sir, do we need to speak to a judge first? Look, we know they're as guilty as sin. Better to beg forgiveness than ask permission is what I always say. Sir. We're all talking Sandler. Help! Who's there? Higgins! Master! Lads! Mr. Potter! Are you all right? I'm alive. That's what you're asking. Do you know who that man was? I don't know. <sighs> he got away. The lads are still after him. Did you recognize him? No. From the police sketch. That's the old woman's henchman. <sighs> you were sent by Mr. Prescott? I very much admire your work, Miss Hart. Oh, thank you. I've read about you in the papers. You're quite the inspiration for those of us entering the field. Hmm. Was that so? Everyone was all abuzz after those witch killings you saw last year. Oh. Ergot poisoning. Imagine that. Actually, the victim died of anaphylaxis, but I appreciate the sentiment. Shall we begin? Of course. Okay. Case 583, the exhumation of Abigail Prescott. She hasn't been in the ground for so long. It seems the cold conditions have helped. Mr. Wright and I will now examine the skin for puncture or injection marks. They didn't find anything. Nothing? There were no puncture wounds or syringe marks present anywhere on her body. We were wrong. I'm sorry.
William Murdoch. William, I found out who sent that inmate to try and kill me. You did? Who? His name is Gunnar Bjornsson. His description matches that of the farmer who bribed the Scrivener. Oh, and I need you to send $50 to an address for me. Getting that name wasn't cheap. It may not make any difference. The exhumation was a failure. It, it yielded nothing. What, what does that mean? Without the syringe mark or the missing pages, anything Miss Bjornsson has done becomes circumstantial. Inconsequential. Oh. I'm so sorry, Julia. What are you doing? It's a small mark on her lip. Where? Here. Hmm. It just makes me think, if not a syringe mark, perhaps someone forced the victim's mouth open in some way. Giving her laudanum against her will? Precisely. I would have noticed a chipped tooth or pierced lip. Beyond that, I don't see how such a thing could ever be established. Did you examine the inside of her mouth? Yes, but... I admit, not with a specific mind to finding such indicators. You sure this man works for Prescott? Absolutely. The man's trying to kill me after everything I've done for him. What exactly have you done for him? I'm not telling you a thing. Sir, as you can see, constables are collecting every scrap of paperwork in this place, and others will be searching your accounting office. And what of it? If you've been stealing from charity, we'll find out whether you help us or not. Why are you protecting someone who wants you dead? If I help you convict him, can you keep me out of jail? That may be something we can arrange. I've been in charge of the Alderman's accounts for over a decade. And he has been, indeed, stealing money. From the hospital charity? Among others. We run the donations through the tailor shop so that they appear as legitimate earnings when we deposit them. And then I talk to the financials to ensure it. Stealing from a hospital is particularly rotten. The hospital is just the tip of the iceberg. Is everything all right? Just having a quick look at one more thing. Now, hold on. The purpose of this exhumation was to search for a syringe mark. It will just take one moment. This examination was not explicitly requested. What is that? Oh, my. Gunnar Bjornsson. Criminal threats, assault, attempted murder, and there's more. Oh? The last time he was in jail, he was bailed out by none other than Alderman Prescott. That's a direct connection. We have his last known address. The lads and I will bring him in. And Crabtree and Higgins have managed to get the accountants to spill. The alderman's going down one way or another. The only problem is none of this exonerates Julia. McNabb? We have word from the morgue, sirs. Good up, Bjornsson. The one and only. You're under arrest for bribery, interference with a police investigation, and attempted murder. Can I finish my stool first? Don't get smart. Get him out of here! What a waste. Thank you for your patience. We have completed our examination of the exhumed body of Abigail Prescott. There were no previously undiscovered markings on the skin. However, we were able to find an anomaly that was not discovered in the original postmortem. Yes, a foreign object in the deceased's mouth stuck in the back of her esophagus. The object seems to have moved closer to the top of the throat due to the body's decomposition. Hence why it wasn't previously found, despite Mr. Wright's good work. A brass button. A button? Why would she have swallowed a button? No, I didn't. Is that all? Good day, detective. It was him. 
I have already signed the petition and expect to have a plan in place as early as next week. Please excuse me for a moment. Detective Murdoch, of course. So what do I owe the pleasure? Oh, believe me, Alderman. The pleasure is all mine. Is that so? Dear, I thought you didn't like me. I don't. What are you doing? That is quite enough of this harassment, Detective. Alderman Prescott, you are under arrest for the murder of your wife, Abigail Prescott. Every piece of evidence detailing the alderman's misdeeds. It's time enough to send him away for years to come. Evidence of his financial crimes and the button that places him at the scene of the murder. Mrs. Prescott was sending us a message. You think she swallowed it on purpose? In her final moments, yes. Bringing him to justice from beyond the grave. In addition to all of that, this Bjornson fella turned on the alderman faster than a lion's lunch. He admitted to distracting Dr. Ogden while the alderman murdered his wife. I'd be willing to wager that that is finally the end of Alderman Prescott. There is no doubt of your innocence now. I'm so relieved, William. Effie said the Crown will ask the judge to overturn the verdict in the morning. I'll be released by noon. That's wonderful. I can hardly stand the thought of you spending one more night here. Me neither. Although... The warden has extended an olive branch in light of my wrongful imprisonment. He's invited me to a family dinner. Oh? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Ask the judge to overturn the verdict in the morning. I'll be released by noon. That's wonderful. I can hardly stand the thought of you spending one more night here. Me neither. Although... The warden has extended an olive branch in light of my wrongful imprisonment. He's invited me to a family dinner. Oh. <laughs> mm. Dinner will be served shortly. And you've lived behind these prison walls with your mother and father your whole life. I have. That's quite something. I suppose I'm just... A bird in a gilded cage. <laughs> oh, I meant to say thank you again for letting me use this dress for the evening. It's fine. I don't wear it anymore. <sighs> uh, so your mother tells me that you're engaged. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, that must be him now. Oh, apologies for my lateness, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Garland. Julia Ogden. What a surprise to see you here. Yes, what a surprise. You two know each other. Yes, Julia used to be my sister-in-law. That is, before my brother was murdered and she very hastily remarried. Hmm? Um, Dr. Ogden is an inmate at the prison now. You don't say. Well, you're certainly not dressed like one. I was accused of a crime which I didn't commit, and I've been exonerated. I simply need to meet with the judge in the morning. Not much seems to stick to you, I guess. Oh, was Dr. Ogden the woman who caused you to leave the crown attorney's office? Oh, come now. It's all water under the bridge. I'm an estate lawyer now. Left the sordid world of crime behind. Look, Julia, I know our paths have diverged somewhat, but I can assure you there's no hard feelings on my end. Hmm? Darling? Thank you, Jane. I'll have to read your book, Dr. Ogden. Hmm. You've written a book, have you? Yes, with my husband, William. I'm thinking of writing one myself on prison reform. Joseph has set up gardens for the inmates and a library. They do have a calming effect. Of course, the strongest deterrent to recidivism is corporal punishment. To be frank, I don't believe that corporal punishment is ever appropriate. Well, considering you're an inmate, I can see why you hold that opinion. More peas. 
Oh, damn. I've spilled mustard on my jacket. You put too much on your beef. You always do. Lauren, your jewelry is stunning. Thank you. I inherited some of my grandmother's. May I ask about your locket? It seems to be broken. I know. <laughs> Silly, really, that I keep wearing it, but oh, yeah. it has sentimental value. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Sarah, you shouldn't have brought that drink to Mr. Hymas. He asked for it, ma'am. I don't know why you don't listen to me, Joseph. Ice is bad for the Constitution. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Ogden? Well, I actually have never heard that theory. Mother believes all drinks should be tepid. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm sure you're all right, sir. It's just the beef is poorly cooked, as usual. <laughs> Hence the need to disguise it with mustard. <clears throat> ah, Jane. <sighs> Here, get this stain out for me, would you? Everyone, we will reconvene in the drawing room in a quarter of an hour. I'll bring up some imperial toquet from the cellar. Until then, I will be resting in my room. As will I. Please feel free to make yourself comfortable in the drawing room. There's more wine in there. You seem to be enjoying it. Mind if I smoke? Mm, I've never cared for cigar smoke, actually. Mm. No bother. Over time, you'll hardly notice it. I was just with Joseph in his study. He's got some wonderful cigars. Is everyone coming soon? I've just done this baked Alaska, and it doesn't last long. No, it looks heavenly, Sarah. What were you in prison for? Stealing the soul of a great chef? <laughs> the beef aside, of course. I think I'll go find Mr. Hymas. I'm looking forward to that, okay? Well, while you're up, see if you can't find my fiance. Hmm? Oh, and tell her to hurry. This dessert will not take long to melt. Mr. Hymas? Dear God! Dr. Ogden? What's happened? I just found him like this. Is he dead? What's all this? Dear God. Uh, Jane, telephone the police uh, immediately. Leslie? Joseph! Joseph! Mother! Oh, 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 what's going on? He felt it's been stabbed. How is that possible? I locked both of the doors before dinner. All of the windows are locked. No one could have gotten in from outside. What if that's true? It means one of us is a murderer. <gasps>doing here i came looking for your father and i found him lying here why were you hovering over him i was checking to see if he was alive julia step away from the body i will not the sooner i examine him the better chance we'll have of knowing what happened or the better chance you'll have of disguising what you did oh, lauren why would dr ogden kill your father maybe lauren is right julia step away oh for goodness sake the police said they won't be here for hours they're not coming immediately oh these wretched police everyone where were you right before Dr. Ogden discovered Mr. Hymas? I was resting in my room. As was I. I was cleaning Mr. Hymas's jacket. I got all the mustard off. I can show you. And I was browning the meringue on the baked Alaska. And where were you, Mr. Garland, before you came into the drawing room and spoke to me? I told you I was with Joseph in the study, and I remained there when he stepped out. Poor man. Well, that's everyone accounted for, then. <gasps> oh, God, mother. What is that dreadful woman doing? I'm taking this to the kitchen. I need cocoa and a paintbrush. So everyone has their own different... Finger marks, yes. The oils naturally present in the human hand leave the trace of a unique pattern. Amazing. I can see some clear finger marks. Well, now what? We'll lock this in the cupboard, and then I'll take everyone's finger marks to compare. I'll need an ink pot, a cloth, and several cards. <laughs> I love this song. It's one of my favorites. So, how are you settling into university life? 
It's hard. Not everyone's welcoming. But in here, well, it's better. All my fraternity brothers already feel like, well, brothers. All right, all right. Pack it up, everyone. Pack it up. Gentlemen, what's the trouble? This hall's been booked already by Theta Gamma Delta, so... Uh... Clear out. We booked this hall with a D. Isn't that right? Well, he unbooked it. The party's over, fellas. You don't tell me what to do. Hell faded outside. He needs help. Let's go. Please let us through. We have a medical examiner here. He's dead. I saw him just before he fell to the ground. He was walking, then he started coughing like he was choking. Was he alone? Yes. It was like he suddenly couldn't breathe. I waved at him, tried to ask him what was wrong, but he couldn't speak. Something was constricting his windpipe. This doesn't sound right. Run to a call box. Telephone station house number four. Ask for Detective Murdoch. Yes, ma'am. What do you think, Violet? Well, I see some watery blood on his collar. Still wet. He coughed it up before he died? This doesn't just happen to a healthy young man. Staying late this evening, sir? Yes. Margaret's sister is visiting. She can not only talk for England, but the whole of the bloody British Isles. Ah, yes, you've mentioned her. Mm. I'm glad it works out for Julia. She comes home tomorrow, right? Yes, and I plan to spoil her. <laughs> Got some new maths equations to look over? <laughs> no, biology. <sighs> no rest for the wicked, me mucker. All right, that's everyone. Yes, everyone but you. Thank you, Mr. Garland. Jane, come here. Where is my gold clock? I don't know. It always sits on this shelf. Where has it gone? Honestly, I couldn't say. I, I can't remember when I saw it last. Are you sure it hasn't fallen into an apron pocket? Don't accuse me. I'm not a thief. No. You are an inmate of the prison. That should do it. Now that we have everyone's finger marks on these cards, we just need to compare it to those that were on the knife. Very good. Shall we? What have you, Miss Hart? Well, a young man named Harold Tandy. He collapsed at the university. He coughed up water mixed with blood right before he died. Well, what would cause that? It's too soon for me to speculate. Mr. Buchanan. Hello, detective. Were there any witnesses? Just one, uh, fraternity brother of mine. He said Harold was alone when he fell to the ground. Hmm. Uh, w was he someone you knew? Not well, but I know Harold's lady friend. Hmm. Well, perhaps she can inform us of his whereabouts earlier in the evening. You seem to have spilled a bit of paint on your... I was cleaning up when you called me about Harold. I understand you were seeing Mr. Tandy. I told the detective that you two were together. Harold was always so cautious of telling anyone about us. Only a few people knew. When was the last time you saw him? Just this morning at the library. Uh, how did he seem? He was fine. Which is why what happened later was such a shock. And what was that? He put a letter in my mailbox, breaking it off with me. He said he never wanted to see me again. It didn't make sense. <laughs> I can't believe the knife is gone. Someone broke the lock. Indeed. And you were the last one seen with the knife. Mr. Garland, whatever enmity you still harbor against me, please let it go. This is neither the time nor the place. I don't know what you're talking about. What is that smell? It's, it's coming from the ice. It smells like mothballs. 
You're right. I think it's camphor. Why would there be camphor in the ice? Camphor is a poison. Didn't Mrs. Hyman say that every time the warden had a drink, he felt sick? Yes, and he was the only one who had drinks with ice. So who would usually make his drinks? That would have to be Sarah. Yes? Uh, Sarah, I've noticed something unusual about the ice. Sarah? Sarah. <sighs> Why were you poisoning the warden? Honestly, Dr. Ogden, I would never kill anyone. You are a convicted criminal, though. I served my time, and it wasn't for anything violent. I just wrote my boss's name on some checks, that's all. You lace the warden's eyes with camphor, Sarah. That's a serious offense. I knew it wouldn't kill him. Just make him bilious. The old coot deserved it. Well, why did you have such animosity toward him? Didn't you see what he does to inmates in that prison? Slogs them for the littlest thing. I've had friends left half dead from his beatings. Julia. What is it? Someone's burning these papers. Looks like someone's lists and inventories. I recognize the handwriting. These were written by Mr. Hymas. He was just throwing them out. I used them to get the fire lit. You didn't find the knife? No. Searched everywhere. Besides, the baked Alaska Sarah brought into the drawing room proves that she was in the kitchen when Mr. Hymas was killed. Meringue will burn in a heartbeat if you don't watch it every second. I never saw the warden. On my word. Well, I am loath to take the word of a criminal, but perhaps Mrs. Green is not the killer after all. What was Harold doing during the day? I think he was with Miss Harris. We know Mr. Tandy was with Miss Harris earlier, but what was he doing later in the day? Well, we was all at the house together. He was studying in the main room just before dinner. And then we all went to the hall for the dance. And why would Mr. Tandy be walking outside alone? Maybe he just needed some air. I don't know, Detective. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. That will be all. If I have any further questions, I'll let you know. These are my brothers. I don't think they're lying. You were with everyone at the fraternity house? I had two classes, then I took Miss Hart out for dinner before the dance. Mr. Tandy was new to Iota Delta Phi, yes? Yes. He's being initiated next week. Uh, I've heard that some of these fraternity initiations can be quite dangerous. Not these fellows. They were planning nothing more than making him drink rye while doing a handstand. Well, hardly what killed Mr. Tandy. But still, if you could ask around just to be sure he was where your fraternity brothers say he was. Sure thing. How well did you know the warden? Well enough. He was to be my father-in-law, after all. So who in this house would want to kill him? I have no idea. Sarah was very upset about her past experiences in prison with the warden. But Jane is a current inmate. For a violent offense? Well, Lauren says it was self-defense. Are Jane and Lauren friends? Yes. Apparently, the warden was constantly shouting at Jane how she had scorched his shirts or not waxed the floors properly, etc. He could be a real tyrant when he wanted to be. And yet she kept working for him. Well, I imagine it's preferable to being held behind bars. Wouldn't you say, Julia? Perhaps she'd grown tired of his abuse. I think a conversation with Jane may be in order. I already told you I was cleaning the warden's jacket. Yes, but there was approximately 10 minutes between the end of dinner and when Mr. Hymas was killed. And I was all the way at the back of the house, at the wash tub. I understand you and the warden had a contentious relationship. Relationship? That man treated me like dirt. End of story. Were you fed up? Did he push you too far and you finally snapped? 
It never got that bad. Lauren always stuck up for me. Besides, do you really think I would do anything that would keep me in prison longer than I have to be? I've seen people do all manner of things when they get desperate. Well, I didn't hate him as much as some here. Oh? You know what I mean? Mrs. Hymas and the Warden? She hated him. She was always yelling at him. If there's anyone here who's glad he's dead, it's her. We did have our disagreements. Well, Jane told us that you were constantly angry at Mr. Hymas. My husband gave me a beautiful home and everything I could have asked for. I'm happy, or I was. Forgive me for saying this, Mrs. Hymas, but I got the impression that you weren't. I'll admit, living inside the enclosure of prison walls is a strain. Lauren told me you never went near the prison. In fact, you hardly leave the house at all. Why would I? To speak with oafish guards? To teach degenerate prisoners cross-stitch? You don't like it here. Who would? I hate living as we do. And my husband was the most intransigent man on earth. But I cleave to my husband, as the Bible says. I am a good woman. Come now, Mrs. Hyman. Leslie, stop. Could you leave us for a moment? I would like to speak with Dr. Ogden privately. Very well. What? Joseph hated him. But Leslie told me your husband couldn't wait for the wedding. <laughs> he would. I'll wager Leslie also told you that he was very successful. Both lies. So Mr. Hymas was against the marriage? They fought only a few nights ago. Joseph told him that if he didn't get his life together, he would see to it that the marriage was off. But is Leslie really that attached to Lauren? Enough to cause your husband harm? No, I don't believe they are love's young dream. But Joseph was planning on giving Leslie a sizable dowry. Any findings yet, Miss Hart? He has scratches on the top of his forehead and his left ear, deep enough to draw blood. Hmm. These wounds are recent? They appear to have been made within the last 24 hours. Any idea what may have caused those? Hard to say. You mentioned that he coughed up watery blood before he died. Indeed. The only time I've seen that is in a drowning victim. But this man was walking on dry land. Come now, Julia. You really are stretching things. Joseph loved me like a son. You may be alone in that opinion. Well, what does it matter, anyway? Hmm? You know I didn't do this. I know no such thing. Well, I do. As I told you, after dinner, I went to the water closet, and then I went to Joseph's study, and I... What? <laughs> the cellar door. What about it? It's always kept shut. Mr. Hymas is the only one allowed to go down there. And? Well, uh, after dinner, I noticed the cellar door was ajar, and so, naturally, when I saw Joseph in the study, I... I asked him if he'd already gotten the toquet. But he said no. That he hadn't gone down to the cellar yet. Well, it's late enough that Margaret's sister should be in bed now. That's my excuse. How come you're burning the midnight oil? Well, the nanny assures me that Susanna has gone to sleep, so I thought I would continue to work until Julia returns home. Oh, Mr. Buchanan. What brings you to our station house? Uh, nothing good, I'm afraid. I'm assisting the detective. Oh? Mr. Buchanan was present when a man died at the university. We suspect foul play. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. I'll leave you to it. Good evening, gentlemen. I've learned that all my fraternity brothers went swimming at the pool before the dance. So they lied. What were they hiding? Well, they weren't supposed to be there. It's against university policy. I'll give you three guesses as to why. I understand. 
Was Mr. Tandy with them? Yes. And there's something else that's it's probably nothing. Uh, Please. On my way here, someone stopped me to ask about Harold. They said they saw the Iota Delta Phi brothers leave the pool. And was Mr. Tandy with them? They saw a group of Iota Delta Phi leave, but Nathaniel and Harold weren't with them. So Mr. Woodson, the only witness to Mr. Tandy's death out on the street, was also with him alone at the pool just prior. What exactly are we looking for? Anything out of the ordinary. A button, a brooch, cigar ash. Cigar ash? I don't like what you're implying, Julia. Did you turn out the lights, Mr. Garland? What are you doing, Mr. Garland? Stay away from me! Dodgy wiring, I guess. Real pity about the wine, though. Yeah, let's keep looking. Mm. Dear God. What is it? 1892 Chateau Latour. The old man had been holding out on me. Oh, for goodness sake. Mrs. Hi, Mrs. Shaw. She had this on at dinner. What would she be doing down here? She never touched a drop. There's blood all over it. I don't think she was down here for the wine. Mrs. Hymas killed her husband. I don't know what you mean. Joseph hates it when anyone comes down here except for himself. Don't lie to us, Mrs. Hymas. How dare you? Mrs. Hymas, we know you are in the cellar tonight. Fine. Yes. I come down here to drink. It dulls my pain. I hate this house. And I hated Joseph. He was a tyrant. But I didn't kill him. Then how do you explain this? What is this? It's your shawl, Mrs. Hymas, with your husband's blood all over it. But that can't be. I, I wore my shawl with the fringe tonight at dinner. This is my other shawl. Yes, but this shawl still belongs to you, doesn't it? How did it end up down here, bloodied? I don't know. I'll admit, I did come down here for a drink after dinner. I heard Joseph and I hid. When I went up the stairs, I heard a noise. And I found him on the floor, dead. And did you see anyone else? No. And I knew instantly that if I cried out, it would look like I stabbed him. So I stepped over the body, and I went to my room. <sighs> Mrs. Hymas, I'm afraid to say, this evidence is very damning. Mr. Woodson, you were the last person seen with Mr. Tandy. Yes, I've already told you. Saw him cough and then collapse on the sidewalk. What happened at the pool? You both know about that? Nothing. Took a while to get changed, and Harold waited for me. There was no sort of altercation between the two of you at the pool? No. Harold didn't even go swimming. He said he didn't feel well. I went back to the house to get dressed for the dance, and the next time I saw Harold, he was on the street. Mrs. Hart should have her postmortem completed. I'd like to hear her findings before we proceed. Detective. I can hurt Harold. It's my friend. Harold Tandy did not drown in a pool. Are you sure? Have a look at this. A boat. A pond beetle. I found it in his lungs along with some algae. Harold Tandy drowned in a pond, not a pool. But that still doesn't explain how he was up and about walking when he died. I think I can explain it. Dry drowning. That sounds impossible. A person can nearly drown but survive. However, their lungs have collected water. 
which later causes pulmonary edema. So Mr. Tandy was in a pond yesterday? Yesterday or the day before. I've read of cases that took two days to become fatal. Well, that certainly widens the window of opportunity. Thank you, Miss Hart. Oh, one more thing. I found traces of green paint on the victim inside his ear. We met someone else marked with green paint today. We really should cover him up, Julie. It's gruesome. This is a criminal investigation, Mr. Garland. Now look at this. Ugh, do I have to? The blood on his collar is still quite red and fresh. And? Look at the blood on this shawl. It's dry and stiff. I should have seen it before. It's not his blood. Someone placed this there earlier. So someone manufactured evidence against Mrs. Hines? Lauren found it. This is too much. Lauren, what is it? I felt something poking me when I sat down. It was under the cushion. Did you touch it? No. Your handkerchief. Uh, right. We need the finger marks on it. Well, who put it there? The murderer, presumably. And who is that? It's a tented arch. That's impossible. Well, who do they belong to? Me. You killed my father? This must be the knife I used at dinner. It's not the murder weapon. We have to keep looking. <gasps> Please, Julia. Leslie! I think it's best if you sat down. What are you doing? This is ridiculous. What interest would I have in killing the warden? I'm about to be released tomorrow morning. I have no idea why you would do it. But you have blamed everyone in this household except yourself. I wouldn't put anything past her. She's responsible for the death of my beloved brother. What? Your first husband, remember? Leslie Garland is trying to frame me for this murder, and I can explain to you all why. Green paint on Harold? Are you sure? You had green paint on your sleeve earlier. It was just a silly sorority thing. You must admit, it's quite a coincidence, Miss Harris. Penny, please help us. We use it in our initiations. We paint all the new girls' faces green. Do any other groups use green paint? My sorority is the sister to Theta Gamma Delta. They paint new brothers green, too. Why would Leslie frame you? It fits in with his previous behavior. Leslie Garland blames me for his brother's death. So for some time, he made my life hell. What did he do? He posed as a sequential killer who was after my husband. He tried to keep us apart. He terrorized me. I sent some letters, Julia. I was angry. You ruined my life. You cost me my job at the Crown Attorney's office. That's the least that you deserved. You're pathetic. My brother would still be alive if it weren't for you. <gasps> Look, his cuff. There's something brown on your shirt, Leslie. It looks like cocoa. Why would you have cocoa on your sleeve? He took Dr. Ogden's knife from the dinner table, and he dusted it with cocoa. Look, how did he get the knife bloody? Oh, Mr. Garland, you didn't. You don't understand. None of you do. This woman is, is evil. You framed Dr. Ogden. Leslie, it was you. You killed my father. Leslie, how could you? What are you saying? Of, of course I didn't do it. Did you kill the warden just to frame me? No, wait a minute. This is getting out of hand. Everybody out. I need to speak with Dr. Ogden uh, alone. Will you murder her too? Please. It's all right. I can defend myself if it comes to that. Let's go, everyone. Apparently, these two have some unfinished business to discuss. All right, we're alone. What is it you have to say to me? I'm sorry. 
You admit it? Look, Julia, I have no idea whose finger marks are on the murder weapon, all right? But I saw one last chance to get my revenge for what you did, and I took it. For what I did? I didn't kill Darcy. But he'd still be alive if he'd never met you. Don't you think it's time you let this go? You're right. This anger towards you has been eating me from the inside out. I hate not being a crown attorney anymore. Going into a state lab, but it's just so boring. Well, perhaps this could be a fresh start for you. You could find a career that is truly fulfilling. I fear marrying Lauren is a mistake, too. My life's such a mess. Leslie. It's not too late. You're right. What are you doing? I, I thought that's what you wanted. You really are a pissant. How does Theta, Gamma, Delta haze their initiates? That's a secret. This is a murder investigation, gentlemen. We don't have time for secrets. Murder? He had a heart attack or something. It had nothing to do with us. Please answer the question. We paint him green and we make him swim ten laps. In a pond. Grenadier Pond. Why? Okay. <laughs> I'm leaving. I don't have to listen to any more of this. What? Let's go. Which chick? Let's go. This is serious. The detective needs to talk to everyone. Don't touch me. Am I under arrest? You just might be. I can explain. There's nothing to explain. You took my gold clock. It was in the dining room, and I've just found it in the kitchen cupboard. But I didn't steal it. Then how did it come to be in your possession? Lauren. Did he confess? Is he guilty? I'm not sure. Lauren, you cannot marry that man. He's horrible. Sarah, it's none of your business. Are you saying that Leslie's guilty? Perhaps it was you. Oh, don't turn on me. It's your mother who hates him so much. I don't know who you think you are. That's enough. Everyone be quiet. Mrs. Hymas, where did your husband keep his outgoing mail? In a tray by the front hall for the mailman to pick up. I'd like all of you to move into the drawing room. I'll join you there in five minutes. Harold Tandy was initiated into Theta Gamma Delta, and it killed him. Detective, are you aware that Chick is Miss Harris's brother? Well, that is most interesting. Because Miss Harris, your sister, told us that Mr. Tandy wrote her a most uncharacteristic letter after they last saw one another, breaking off their relationship. Did you make him do that? How would I make him write a letter? By showing him that you'd kill him if he didn't. You pretended to initiate him to gain his trust, and then held him underwater. You scratched his head with your ring. All right. I had a little fun. But I just scared him so that he'd stay away from my sister. Yeah, Chick wasn't anywhere near Harold when he died. His actions killed him. It's called a dry drowning. And it was at your hand, Mr. Harris. I suppose we'll have to see how much jail time a judge and jury feel you deserve. Please, sit. Mrs. Hymas, I don't believe that Sarah stole your gold clock. Thank you, Dr. Ogden. I believe that Lauren gave it to her in exchange for a favor. What do you mean? I'd like to draw everyone's attention to this. These old letters of the wardens were found in the stove in Sarah's room. I told you I used them as kindling. Did you? Or were they examples of the warden's handwriting used to forge a letter? What letter? I found this in the outgoing mail tray. It's a letter to the head of Court Credit Prison, stating that Jane March 
is pardoned fully and completely effective immediately. I don't know anything about that. But why would Lauren ask Sarah to forge a pardon letter for Jane? Jane, I've noticed that all evening you've been reaching into your apron pocket. Please show us what you have in there. No. You can't make me. You will do as Dr. Ogden says right now. The other half of Lauren's locket. Lauren and Jane were planning to run away together. But what? Lauren, you told me you loved me. I can't believe this. Hold your outrage, Mr. Garland. Oh, please, you can't possibly believe that I knew anything about this. Earlier, when I was searching for the real murder weapon, I was just about to look in this sideboard when you stopped me at gunpoint. The knife. I'm not a betting woman, but I'd wager if I compared everyone's finger marks against those on this knife, they'd match Lauren Hymas's. You were just supposed to get me pardoned. My father would have found out and ruined everything. This way, we could have our freedom and my inheritance. It would have been perfect. That must be the police. Well, they took their sweet time, didn't they? Why is Jane being arrested? She didn't know of my plan. Jane's sentence will be lighter, but she's still part of this crime. Lauren, was everything we had a lie? Yes, Leslie, you repulsed me. It's rather harsh. I had thought you were the only way out of here. And then I met Jane. Well, Julia, although our night together did have a grisly catalyst, I must admit I did rather enjoy our time playing detective. No hard feelings. Mr. Garland, you tried to frame me for murder. Well. Did you find the murder weapon in Lauren's bedroom? Yes, along with a packed bag. I thought Lauren killed her father for his inheritance and kept a bag close by in case she was looking suspicious, but... Well, I thought she did it for us. So you knew that Lauren killed her father, but you did nothing? She was my fiance. Officers, take this man into custody as well. What? Are you trying to ruin my life again? You did that yourself. You'd best watch your back, Julia Ogden. I'll see to it you pay for this. Don't keep the officers waiting. I wasn't expecting to see you. I wanted to surprise you. We were up all night. I thought you'd take the day off and sleep in. Oh, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Neither could you, it seems. I didn't want to miss the class. Oh. Well, how about an early dinner? That sounds perfect. Good. But Violet, do you think we can get to a single date without some calamity? Um, we'll see. <laughs> There's never a dull moment around you. Isn't that why you like me? Hmm. It's not the only reason. Hmm. I'm just glad she's too young to remember that her mother was imprisoned. <laughs> she missed you. I missed you both so much. I'm so glad to be home. What else can I get you? I'll make you anything your heart desires. Honestly, I'm not fussy. As long as it's not steak, cocoa, uh, baked Alaska, or imperial toke. Right, what is toke? What, it's a Hungarian... Uh... It, it doesn't matter. <sighs> Were you really up all night solving the warden's murder? the kettle on and come back and I'll tell you the whole story.
you. There you are. This is so exciting, William. Toronto has entered a new era of sophistication. Is that so? With the creation of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, we're no longer an uncivilized city. Oh, I don't know. I think we're plenty civilized. Have you seen the number of churches lately? Well, for some people, the symphony is the true place of worship. This is the life, Margaret. Mingling with the toffs, quaffing bloody good champagne. Language, Thomas, we're not in the station house. Oh. Margaret! Oh! <laughs> Who's that? You met her. Mrs. Serrano, the music director, oh. is her husband. I'm so happy you could make it. <laughs> we wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs> oh, how wonderful you're an aficionado, Inspector. <laughs> Truth be told, I much prefer the opera. Uh, huh. <laughs> Have you seen Victor and Mr. Serrano? Yes, he was here. I, I've been looking for him. He's supposed to give a speech. Oh. Looks as though I'll have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, oh. honestly. Victor Serrano is the author of a travesty. You have made your opinion known numerous times, Mr. Block. We are the symphony orchestra. Our artists are the pinnacle of musical achievement. That is true. And why? Why we're we bringing in a pianist from Germany. Kriegoff is wonderful. And honestly, he'll put our orchestra on the map. Something we are well unable to do ourselves. Excuse me. Thank you all for coming. My husband, Victor, and I are so pleased that you are all here tonight. And as he is still making final arrangements, the pleasure falls to me of announcing that tonight's performance of the Toronto Symphony will include a performance of Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto No. 1, conducted by Maestro de Lyon and performed with the great pianist, Gregory Kriegoff. <laughs> He played that concerto in New York last year. Apparently, it was fabulous. I've never heard of it. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. He's not a scientist or a criminal. Or a criminal, yes. <laughs> Julia. Julia Ogden. Oh, uh, Herbert. Uh, are you here with the symphony? Uh, yes, yes. That's the very reason I returned to Toronto. Uh, I never thought that I'd see you again. It must be destiny. <laughs> <laughs> May I present my husband, William Murdoch? Pleased to make your acquaintance. Your husband. <laughs> Will the obstacles to our love never cease? <laughs> Who is that? An old flame, long extinguished, I assure you. Hany Ahmans. Violinist. Charmed. Are you in the orchestra? No. There are no women in this orchestra. Oh, is that so? I keep asking Mr. Cyrano, but he won't budge. Perhaps you could petition him for me. <laughs> oh, oh, honestly. No. It's simply not possible. The money isn't there. Imbecile. Just a minute. Stop! Get away from me! Margaret, hold up. Yes. Stop me! Put me through to Station House 4, please. Well, well, sirs. It appears I'm underdressed for the occasion. Although, given the circumstances, I suppose it's appropriate. Clearly, it was garroted, but there seems to be no other signs of trauma. No murder weapon left behind. Oh, my. What is it? They looked like there was a fortune. 
For all the good times, V. Well, we know what that means, don't we? An affair. Oh. Sir, have a look. Pipe and cigarette ash. Two people in the room, perhaps? These look quite unique. Cigarettes from Cairo. Was there anyone else near this office at the time of the murder? Sir, yes. The stage manager, Donald Joseph, has an office just next to here. I have him waiting for you in the lobby. Mr. Joseph, I understand you were in your office at the time Mr. Serrano was killed. Mr. Joseph? That's where I told everyone I would be. But I was sleeping in the piano storage room. Please, don't tell anyone. That's not my concern. Now, you're certain you didn't see anyone? I told you I was asleep. I don't care much for parties. We'll let you know if we have any further questions. It's as you said. He was strangled. Any other injuries? Oh, there were scratches on his neck and cuts on his finger where he tried to get the wire off his neck. Do you have any idea what kind of wire was used? I'm afraid not. All I know at this point was the wire was about an eighth of an inch thick. I also found this. Wood fragments from the garrote? I'll let you know if I find anything else. Thank you, Miss Hart. Julia, have I missed something? Oh, only how fabulous I am, apparently. <laughs> from Herbert Block. Yes, they're all from him. Your old flame. Perhaps not as extinguished as you'd thought. Should I be concerned? Oh, don't be silly, William. Oh, by the way, I spoke to Mrs. Serrano last night at her home. How is she? Do you mean... Do I think she's guilty of something? You know me so well. I know that she's going to be at Symphony Hall. She's going ahead with this concert no matter what. Curious. Certainly didn't grieve long. <laughs> Mrs. Serrano. Detective. You're proceeding with the concert? Of course. The symphony wasn't just my husband's dream. It was a dream we shared. Uh, Mr. Joseph was seen near your husband's office. Do you think it's possible? No, of course not. They were great friends. Do you know of anyone else who may have wished him harm? No, never. He was a man of culture and breeding. We found these diamond earrings in your husband's pocket, along with this note. Oh. <laughs> he must have bought them for our anniversary. <laughs> he was such a romantic. Is there anything else? Um... Mrs. Serrano, did, did your husband smoke? Victor, yes, he smoked a pipe. Anything else? No, never. Now, if you'll excuse me. So you're Julia Ogden's husband? Yes, I am. Is there something I can help you with? Oh, I'm just observing. Trying to imagine what it is she sees in you. Well, she obviously saw enough in me to become my wife. And in the future, I would prefer you stopped sending her unwanted gifts. Are you threatening me? Hardly. 
I would keep my distance if I thought the better man had won, but uh, that just doesn't seem to be the case. I don't know how I can help you. I'm simply an accountant. Have a seat, Mr. Cleavy. In a murder investigation, it's often quite helpful to follow the money. I did warn him that his involvement with a bunch of musicians might be a losing proposition. Was Mr. Serrano involved in any other ventures that would cause him to lose money? Now is the time to be truthful, Mr. Cleavy. I wouldn't call it a venture per se. He was also passionate about women, one in particular. I have a feeling you're not talking about his wife. Mr. Serrano was paying for a lady's apartment. Do you know who the lady was? Mrs. Serrano came to me just last week demanding that I tell her, and I said the same. So Victor Serrano's wife knew of the affair? <laughs> she most certainly did. Sir, what is it, Crabtree? I spoke to Mr. Serrano's bank manager. Diamond earrings we found in his possession. Mrs. Serrano assumed they were a gift for her, but they already belonged to her. He didn't just buy them, he collected them from their safety deposit box. She lied to us. Also, he withdrew $1,000. 1000 The fool. This mystery lady must have cast quite the spell. Mrs. Serrano lied to us. She knew that Mr. Serrano was having an affair. She's admitted this? Serrano's accountant told me. Seems like a good reason for murder. I want it done within the hour, do you understand me? And she appears to have a temper. Within the hour. Mrs. Serrano. Yes? We'd like a few words. I'm quite busy right now. Mrs. Serrano, how long had you known that your husband was having an affair with another woman? Sir. Mr. Serrano withdrew a substantial amount of money just before he was killed. We believe it was for his mistress. Mistress? He had diamond earrings in his pocket and a note that they were for her. You knew your husband was unfaithful, and the earrings and the money were the last straw. You were furious with him. You killed him. Have you two lost your minds? My husband was killed, and instead of being out there finding his killer, you're standing here accusing me? <sighs> Perhaps we could speak somewhere private. Would you rather the station house? Yes. I knew my husband was having an affair. Then why lie? Because I wanted to protect his name. He was a good man, even though he was unfaithful. And even though he was going to give your diamond earrings to someone else? Well, I didn't know about that, truly. And if I had killed him, wouldn't I have taken them with me instead of leaving them with him? Who was your husband having an affair with? I don't know. I asked him. Huh. I don't know who it was. He told me he was going to end the affair and have nothing more to do with that woman. I believed him. I loved him. Am I under arrest? Not at this time. If Mrs. Serrano is to be believed, the mistress was about to be let go the night of the murder. So he tried to rid himself of her. She took exception and strangled him. Perhaps. But she didn't take the earrings. Well, it's possible she didn't know about them or simply took the money and ran. Like to the love nest. Possibly. Cleaver the accountant paid the bills. He'll know where it is. 
Gut, ich hau das ist ja unerhört! Da fällt eine Klavierseite! Damit kann ich doch nicht sprechen, denn das Klavier funktioniert so nicht! May we be of assistance? Who are you? Detective William Murdoch, Inspector Brackenreed, Toronto Constabulary. Did you call the police on me, Papa? Absolutely not. They've been here since Victor's death. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gentlemen, I am Gregory Kriegoff. Have you had any luck finding my dear friend Skiller? Not as of yet, but rest assured that we will. Now, what appears to be the problem? <laughs> Everything. I can understand that the dressing room is not so good, Barbara. I can understand that there is no tailor in Toronto who can order a suit jacket, but what I cannot understand, Barbara, is a... Faulty piano! How am I to play Tchaikovsky on this, huh? I, I don't know how it happened. It, the piano was in the storage room until this morning. Well, if it happened, it did. <laughs> and now you must fix it. May I take a look? What do you know about pianos? I don't. Well, I don't. The fire is gone. Now we know where the garrote came from. Oh, we met at university. Was it a serious affair? More for him than me. We only stepped out a couple of times, but he became obsessed with me. At first it was rather flattering, but then most disconcerting, so I broke it off. Are you worried now? Well, of course not. Well, Julia, some men don't know how to take no for an answer. It was a long time ago. Years only intensify those desires. will be filled with music and flowers. The only name I have for that apartment is Mr. Serrano. There was a woman who lived there, or at least frequented the building. I don't know what you're implying. Did you see a lady go in and out of the building? Oh, no. And it's been quiet as the grave the last few days. Oh, what a blessed relief. What, there was... Noise coming out of there. <laughs> Was there? The same tune over and over again on a violin. <sighs> Sometimes I could hear a woman curse when she played the wrong note. So you never saw the woman, but you heard her playing? Oh, late at night. I'd hear. <laughs> You're humming the Tchaikovsky tune. Oh, if you say so. Now, if you don't mind. Miss Simard, may we have a word? Of course. To what do I owe the pleasure? This is not a pleasant visit, I'm afraid. I see. Miss Ahmad, what was the nature of your relationship with Victor Serrano? I suppose if you are asking, you are well aware of it. Victor loved me, and I loved him. But not enough to leave his wife for you. Men are cowards. He was breaking it off with you, wasn't he? Miss Ahmad, did Victor Serrano pay you money the night that he was killed? I am not a harlot, sir, and you will not speak to me as if I was one. My interest is simply in finding out who killed Mr. Serrano. Something I had nothing to do with. You smoke, Miss Ahmad? On occasion. Why? May I see your cigarettes? Egyptian cigarettes. Interesting. And very expensive. Mr. Krigov gave me the whole package. The pianist? Hand-rolled specially for him in Cairo. Would you care for one? For the purposes of evidence? Thank you. 
It's my belief that smoking reduces your lung capacity. Can't possibly be good for you. Many things that aren't good for you bring you pleasure, sir. Ain't that the truth? Good day. Mr. Creed Huff, Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. Accept my apologies. Do you always carry a gun when you bathe? On occasion. I'm a little on edge lately. Mm. Mr. Krieghoff, I know you lied. You didn't just arrive in Toronto today, did you? I may not have, but this is hardly a crime, is it? These are your brand? Hmm, indeed. We found this packet in Mr. Serrano's office the night that he was killed. Oh, but they are not unique to me. Miss Ahmad says that they are. Ah, yes, she's a delightful creature. Is she not? Perhaps not. <laughs> Did she kill Victor? Mr. Krieghoff, what were you doing with Mr. Serrano before he died? If you prefer, I can take you down to the station house and throw you in our cells. You wouldn't. Prison would ruin my reputation. <clears throat> Turn around. So you can raise your weapon at me again? So I can get out of the tub. I will explain everything, please. <clears throat> I was with Victor before he died. I wired him from New York, <clears throat> desperate. You see, uh, some very bad men had told me that if I did not give them money, <clears throat> that they were going to cut off my fingers. <clears throat> Who were these men? Uh, I would rather not say, but they wanted a thousand dollars. Why? <sighs> well, uh, I might have owed it to them, but Victor, he's an old friend, and he said that he would give me the money, so. How do I know you weren't extorting him? I would never. I love Victor. Victor saved my life. He wanted to just give me the money, but I promised him I would pay him back every penny, and I still will just to his widow. Did Mr. Serrano say anything to you about his life? Was anyone threatening him? Not him. But something was threatening his mistress. Apparently a former acquaintance of hers was getting a little pushy. She told him someone was threatening her life? I suppose so. But then Victor did also say that she was one of those people who was just prone to these flights of fancy, so... <sighs> Poor Victor. He just did not know what to believe. Sir, who do you think did it? Could be any one of them, George. We have four viable suspects, no murder weapon. But we know it was piano wire, is that right, sir? It was. Didn't Mr. Joseph tell us he was sleeping in the storage room where they kept pianos? He certainly did. Henry. Sir. See what you can find out about a Herbert Block. He's a member of the orchestra. Of course, sir. Herbert Block, sir. I don't see him on your board there. He isn't. It's an unrelated matter, George. Mm. 
Hello? Hello? What are you doing here? I'm here for you. D did you just walk into my house? When we were courting, you didn't mind a surprise visit? That was a very long time ago. This is for you. My lady. Oh, for goodness sake, Herbert, get up. I'm married, Herbert, and very happily. Run away with me. Leave at once, or I'll see to it that my husband puts you behind bars. Julia. Get out. Out. Out! Ah. attended symphony performances in the past, have you not? I have. What instrument does the conductor play? None at all, George. Well, then what exactly does he do? He leads the orchestra. How exactly does he do that? This must be the storage room. So this is where Mr. Joseph was sleeping. Sir, a letter from him to Miss Ahmad. Why won't you answer me, my love? You are killing me. It's odd he didn't send it. He sounds quite lovesick. Sir, can I ask another question, if you don't mind? Yes, of course, George. Do you think it's time I start thinking about having children? Oh, I don't think I'm the person I to I just don't answer. want to do it at too advanced an age. <laughs> I hardly think that you're that. You I mean, yeah, you know, I wonder how you manage sometimes. Well, just as we're, you and Dr. Ogden are, oh, my, what do we have here? Oh, if I'm not mistaken, that is the murder weapon. What are you doing here? Mr. Joseph, we'd like to have a word. Stop! I need to talk to you. Mr. Block does know you're married. I did make that clear, yes. I'll have a word with him. Oh, thank you. His visit was a troubling intrusion. Usually I wouldn't worry, but with Susanna, of course. Thank you. But if you Mr. Carly, you are a pleasure to watch perform, but you are undisciplined. Please, shape up. Mm. Mrs. Serrano, if I might have a word. I heard that Mr. Joseph ran off. Did you catch him? Uh, no, Mr. Joseph hasn't returned to his former lodgings, and constables haven't seen him anywhere. I don't know why he would run. There must be some misunderstanding. Uh, you stated earlier that Mr. Joseph and your husband were quite close. Is it possible there was some animosity? Never. Donald and Victor were friends. They both loved the symphony. They lived for the music. Now, if you'll excuse me. Of course. The, excuse me, Sir Wilbur. Of course. That chap is the conductor, isn't he? Indeed. Do not disturb him. He's very busy. No, of course. I, I'm just curious as to what does a conductor do? Excuse me? Well, all you musicians read music, do you not? Of course. And you all rehearse and practice together? Regularly. So the musicians all know their parts? I should hope so. Then presumably you could all play those parts together, even if he were, say, not there. Is there a point to your inquiries? Well, I'm just curious as to what does a conductor do? He is the maestro. 
is the lord and master of the music. George? Sir? Ah, I'm sure the role of conductor is very necessary. Necessary in ways I can't fathom. Sorry for a hat. I need you to go to Miss Ahmad's rooms. Now, if Mr. Joseph is in love with her, as the note suggests, then that's likely the next place he'll go. Sir? Are you sure you don't want some? Yeah, thank you. No. Please sit. Do you really think Mr. Joseph will come here? Well, it's a hunt of the detectives. We have reason to believe that Mr. Joseph was in love with him. It wouldn't surprise me. I know it sounds scandalous, but Mr. Serrano was going to leave his wife for me. Was he now? Yes. And that is likely why Mr. Joseph killed him. Do you know that? I don't know it, but it does stand to reason, doesn't it? <sighs> Love's labor is never easy. What do you mean? Oh, the symphony. I have no stage manager, an angry soloist, and now my principal second violinist has quit. Herbert Block? Yeah. Why? Oh, he said his heart was broken. Where is he now? I have no idea. So you think this was the murder weapon? I believe so, yes. And you say you found it among Mr. Joseph's possessions? Yes. Why did he get rid of it? Perhaps he didn't have time. That fact is troubling me as well. Sir, look at this. It's a letter from Miss Ahmad begging Mr. Serrano to let her play violin in the orchestra. She's definitely persistent. She even told me that. No, there's something. Look at this, sir. We found this letter in the storage room, supposedly written by Mr. Joseph. They're written in the same hand. She wrote them both, but why? To make Mr. Joseph appear guilty of murder. We're dealing with a very devious woman, Murdoch. One who George is currently with. It was going to be perfect. Mr. Serrano was going to help me truly begin my career as a soloist. My life was going to be a wonderful adventure. But now, it is in ruins. Donald, get out! You told me you loved me. I don't want to see you. Constable, arrest him! You, Mr. Joseph, you're coming to the station house with me. You're under arrest for murder. Murder? I did no such thing. You had motive. We found your love letter to Miss Ahmad. She was having an affair with Serrano. Did you kill him so you could have her to yourself? I didn't. Anya, how could you? What you? Help me, Dad. Uh, uh, you betrayed me. <sighs> Sirs, better late than never. I want to go home. I'm afraid that is not in your future. We found your finger marks on the weapon that killed Mr. Serrano. I don't know how they Please. got... Stop lying. Mr. Serrano wasn't going to leave his wife for you, was he? And he also wasn't going to let you play in the orchestra either. So in a fit of rage, you killed him. You found the whip in Mr. Joseph's office. Because you put it there, along with a desperate love letter to make him appear as though he would be willing to kill for love. I stopped him from killing me. I am a gifted violinist and a woman worth killing for. Can't you see that? Why won't you believe me? I'm a star! My husband may have had a wandering eye, but he did not deserve his fate. Thank you for catching his killer. You're most welcome. My condolences, Mrs. Serena. Victor would have been so pleased with this evening. Oh, well, the show must go on. And I'm sure it will go without a hitch. 
Oh, I wish I had your confidence, sir. <laughs> well, at least you got a violinist back. I saw that Herbert fellow about half an hour ago. Is that so? Ah, sir. Yes? Uh, the other, sir. Uh, what is it, Henry? Well, I found out some news about Mr. Block. He could be a dangerous fellow, sir. How so? He was suspected of killing a man who had stolen his previous lady friend, but nothing could ever be proven. Good gracious, is there a fire? They're simply telling us to take our seats. William? I'll be along in just a moment. better seats <laughs> these seats are fine you're the inspector we should get the better seats margaret will still be able to hear the music but i'll hardly be able to see the handsome conductor <gasps> barely gets the faucet in my dressing room hot enough to soak my arms i'm sure you'll be wonderful pardon me i'm looking for herbert block i <sighs> saw him in the wings earlier but he's not on stage i don't know where he is and the maestro is furious oh. I see. I do love Tchaikovsky. Do you know he was a child prodigy on the piano? Well, I assume most of these composer types were. Perhaps if we have a child, they'll take up the piano. I don't know. Lessons would be awfully expensive. I'm just joking. Only the best for George Jr. It seems our victim wasn't the only one caught in a love triangle. What do you mean? You, me, your old paramour. William. There was never a triangle. There was only a straight line from my heart to yours. Is that so, Doctor? <laughs> you dance beautifully to Tchaikovsky. You're not so bad yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 